We're going to be in Ephesians. Let me pull my pure Bible search software up here. And um, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 5 if you would. I'll get stuff ready here in a little bit. <clears throat> uh oh, my antivirus protection has expired. Oh dear. Oh dear. Ephesians chapter 5. I passed it up. There we go. Chapter 5. All right. We'll get, we'll get going here in a minute. So now I've got to find my Bible. My Bible and my, my beverage. Something that you would gag on called water yeah mercy is right uh, Ephesians chapter 5 let's look and see what God has for us tonight um, we're dealing with the roles the biblical roles uh, that God has for uh, each and every one of us uh, and I know it's been a while since we visited this last, so we're going to kind of back up a little bit and kind of get uh, our bearings and so on and on uh, how important this is. Uh, I will say from, by way of my own testimony, um, it's been several years. I couldn't tell you exactly when um, God dealt with me this way, um, but... I was, I don't, can't remember, if, I think I was, might have been studying Ephesians 5, I might have been studying something else. But the thought occurred to me, the importance of, of biblical marriage and, and what it represented and what it showed. Um, and, you know, I was, I was learning typology, I was understanding how it works and, and who the players are and everything like that. And um, understanding, and I've taught this, you know, different places. When you have a woman in the Bible, uh, you're dealing with either wisdom personified. Uh, thus, you're also dealing with the church. And it's a, it's a, uh, a pure church. Um, she is dressed in white, clothed in, in fine linen, white and clean, for that's the righteousness of the of the saints uh, but then there are some women in the Bible who when you look at it you're going well that's not the, that's not the clean church uh, women like Jezebel Herodias uh, women like that that play the part of a harlot in some way and she is the strange woman she is persona she is mystery Babylon the great personified uh, in the form of a woman and then when you look at that particular passage you look at that particular story uh, then you you gain wisdom from it you give it you get an understanding of who the who the players are uh, let me get let me give you uh, an example of what I'm talking about if you'll bear with me just for a minute and go to uh, let's see here I think it's um, I think it's Second Kings or First Kings, right at the end of First Kings. I think that may be it. Um, yeah, let's see here. First Kings, yeah. First Kings twenty-one. Turn there. Everybody, turn your Bible there. First Kings twenty-one. And. We have, um, we have a woman in this passage. So this woman is either going to represent a good church or this woman is going to represent a harlot. And we have two men. And these, these men are either going to represent Christ or they're going to represent Antichrist. So let's look at it. 
uh, in verse in chapter 21 of 1 Kings, verse 1, and it came to pass after these things that Naboth, that's the man, that's one of the men, Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard. Now think of what Jesus said in John 15. Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. So the vineyard is Christ, okay? And Naboth is going to be a picture of Christ. He is a man that follows the law of God. He's a righteous man. He's holy. He's uh, undefiled from this world. And uh, he, it is his intention to do what the law said with this vineyard. He's gonna, he doesn't have an offspring yet, uh, but that will come. And if his life had been extended, I'm sure he would have found a wife somewhere. And he would have uh, uh, passed down the inheritance uh, that he had, that he got from his father, would have given it to his son. Uh, but he didn't live that long. So it says, it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. So now we have the other man, Ahab. And we're going to find out that Ahab is not a picture of Christ. He's not. And has anybody here ever studied Ahab? I mean, just kind of did a character study of Ahab. It's interesting. You see, you see things about Naboth where he, I mean, he goofs up several times, makes the wrong decision on multiple occasions. But I think he's got a heart that uh, is a repentant heart. Uh, he feels bad for the things he does and so on. But then he's got a wife that just won't let him have a conscience. Okay? That's his problem. Anytime Ahab had messed up and he would have done right, his wife jumps right in there and says, Oh, no, 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 no. We're not going to do what's right here. Are you crazy? So, uh, verse 2, Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than, a, than it. Or, if it seemeth good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. Now, Naboth knows the law. The law said that if Naboth received an inheritance, Naboth, if he wanted to, he could sell it to someone, but only someone who had a right to, to redeem it. In other words, it had to be a near kinsman. It had to be Naboth's brother, Naboth's uh, uncle, Naboth's uh, cousin. Um, any one of those would work. Uh, anybody related to Naboth, whether it was first cousin, second cousin, or whatever. Uh, but it had to be offered to them first. And they had to reject it so that he could go down the line and find somebody that could redeem the property. They could, in other words, it was going to stay in the family no matter what. So Naboth knew the law and he knew he couldn't, couldn't get away with this. So Naboth said to Ahab, verse 3, The Lord forbid it me that I should uh, give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. And this is what I like. I like the fact that words written on a piece of paper have more authority than a king. That's what I like. In other words, Ahab was put in his place by the written law of God. And I like that. I do. I think that is, I, I think it's, a, a, it, it shows the wisdom of God, how that laws that are written down should apply equally to those who govern as well as to those who are governed. In other words, I think 
that Congress and congressmen ought to abide by the same laws that we have to abide by. Amen? I like that. And the president must abide by the same rules and same laws as you and I. I think, I think that's neat as well. But it all comes down to a piece of paper where there's writing on it, and that writing happens to be the law, and that law has more power and authority than even a king has. So Ahab goes in, he's, he's crying, he goes into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him, for he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid down upon his bed, turned away his face, and would eat no bread. That sounds like how I, in my day sometimes. Curled up in bed, head turned away, I don't want to talk to nobody, don't want to see nobody. But Jezebel, but Jezebel... His wife came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? He said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite. And he and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. Woo! Jezebel his wife said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Now, Jezebel is Mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon does not care for the written law of God. She doesn't care. It could be stated in the law 20 different times in 20 different places, 20 different ways. But Babylon Jezebel doesn't care she's got it in her mind that all she has to do is kill Naboth and then she's going to give the land over to her husband and that's what that's what happens uh, she says in verse 7 I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite so we learn a little bit about Jezebel's character or, or Babylon's character, Mystery Babylon uh, and her nature. She is the one who will take God's inheritance that he gives to his people. She will steal it and turn it over to the Antichrist in the last days. The Antichrist is going to... Uh, conquer everything that that is however i believe that babylon is the one who is going to uh secure all of these places all of these kingdoms all of these territories or whatnot she's going to secure them for the antichrist uh kingdom of the last days in other words she's the one wh whatever the antichrist sees and he wants She's the one that gets it for him. Okay? So let's, let's think about this for a minute. Um, I know a preacher. His first name was John. And for years he preached. He preached hard. He preached good. Pastored several churches. Uh, was in evangelism for a long time. Uh, preached a lot of revivals everywhere. Fundamental, uh, had strict uh, standards for his, his life, his family, his children. They didn't have a TV in their home. They didn't listen to the radio. Uh, they didn't uh, do the things that uh, people get involved in as far as the world is concerned. He always preached against worldliness. He preached against materialism. He preached against all kinds of things. And he started pastoring a church down in Arkansas. And this, I've mentioned this before. A um, couple of the, uh, couple of the trustees in the church caught him at a local hotel with his mistress. So here is this man's ministry, his life, 
his, um, his vocation, I guess you could call it, his contribution to the kingdom of God. And what happened to it? Well, he never repented. Never did. He, um, he found himself being more in love with the mistress that he had than he loved his own wife, loved his own family. And he uh, blamed his wife for the affair, blamed his children, blamed everybody except him. And um, this woman that he had, I don't know anything about her, but I just know that she played the part of Mystery Babylon the Great. Because she is the one who took this man's ministry, his life, the things he had built with his life and his ministry, took it and destroyed it. And the last I heard, he had left his wife, left his family. He had a dairy farm, very successful dairy farmer. Left all of that and moved up north to be with this mistress of his. That happens quite a bit nowadays. Preachers walk around with a target on their back. And if they're not careful, then Babylon is going to steal from them everything that they've worked for all their life. And so anyway, you can... You can see from the story of Naboth, I'm not going to read that any longer, but that's what she does. She, she gets, she can do this with a church. In other words, she, you can have a church that is good, straight, fundamental, uh, Bible believing, King James Bible believing church, and the devil will want it. Babylon will be the force that is able to steal away that church, away from serving God, ministering to God, showing people the way of salvation and so on, basically to just another harlot church, and there's millions of them all over the world, just another harlot Jezebel church that's all about the money, it's all about making people feel good, it's all about... Uh, everything except preaching the gospel. And that's how it is. Now, let's go back to Ephesians 5. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And so we have, um, in Ephesians 5, verse 22, let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings now upon your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And then... We get into husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So I want to go back to, uh, let's see here, right here. Uh, we were talking about um, the role of the woman, how in, in the case of Esther, she was the one that finally counseled or counseled um, King, um, who am I thinking of? Mordecai? No. Huh? No. Uh, the book of Esther. Who was the king? Ahasuerus. Yeah, that, you were saying that, weren't you? I couldn't hear it. Uh, Ahasuerus. And we have the parts here. Ahasuerus. We have Haman. He, he's the devil. Okay. So then you have, uh, you have Queen Esther, and she's either going to be, again, she's either going to be a harlot woman, or she's going to be a pure woman, and thus she's going to represent 
uh, the, uh, the, the glorious church without spot or wrinkle. And that's what she does. She advises her king, her husband and her king, Ahasuerus, to do the right thing. And he does. And because of that, God spares everybody. Now, everybody is going to live. Um, when, and, and we learn that our soul is characterized as a woman in the Bible. So let's take this story of Esther. Let's say that Esther is our soul. And um, Mordecai is, of course, Christ, because he comes riding in on a white horse. He's exalted. Haman is the devil. And so Ahasuerus is your physical self, your, 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 the outer man or the old man. Okay? And the old man is either going to listen to uh, Haman, who is the devil, and if he does listen to Haman, what's going to happen to King Ahasuerus? What is God going to do if Ahasuerus allows Haman to start killing all the Jews? What do you think God's going to do about that? Huh? Absolutely. Where's, where's Adolf Hitler's kingdom? Where's the remnants? Where's the statues of Hitler in Germany? Or I'll say, where's the statues of Hermann Goering? Because Goering believed in his heart that he was going to make the peace deal with between Germany and the Allies and that he would be set up as the provincial uh, chancellor of Germany. And word came down, because he was at a... He was at a U.S. facility and word came down that, uh-uh, Goering is a criminal. He is going to be tried in the Nuremberg trials. And when we find him guilty, we're going to hang him. And they stripped Goering of everything they had. They took his sword, took all of his, his patches off that he had, uh, that declared his, his stamina or how high he had reached in the Luftwaffe and so on. They took everything from him, including, get this, his 30 morphine tablets a day. He got addicted to morphine tablets because he was injured in World War I. And he was on 30 morphine tablets a day and maintained that until finally somebody who was watching his cell noticed that he had him in there and they reported it. And the doctor got involved and they said, we're going to give him one pill less a day every day. We're going to wean him off of these. But I want him in his right mind in the trial, which turned out, almost turned out against him because Herman Goring was pretty sh sharp. Anyway, moving right along. Um, yeah, uh, Ahasuerus, the king, would have had... Uh, his whole kingdom destroyed as a result of it. But what happened? When Ahasuerus listened to Esther, the queen, his soul, the Bible says the city rejoiced. They were no longer perplexed. God blessed Ahasuerus. God blessed Esther. God blessed Mordecai. And the gallows that Haman built to start hanging all the Jews, Haman and all of his family got hung on those same gallows. And so here we have a case where Esther, uh, she advises Ahasuerus, her husband, her, her body, uh, and her master, the one she's married to, and God favors that then. And so... We know that our flesh is wicked. However, when our soul rises up and stands up for God and our soul says, listen here, flesh, uh, you're the one in charge so far, but I'm telling you right now, come Sunday morning, you're carrying us to church. You're going to church and you're going to sit in the pew and you're going to listen. You're going to amen the message and you're going to read your Bible. That's how life works 
in the spiritual realm. Then we have uh, Abigail, uh, who counseled David not to kill the man she was married to, because he was Nabal. He was a foolish man. And um, even though this foolish man didn't want Abigail having anything to do with David, when Abigail told uh, Nabal that um, she had been talking to David, the Bible says that uh, his heart turned to stone. Medically, what do you think happened to him? He had a stroke. He had a stroke. And his heart turned to stone for 10 days. So he represents the law. And at the end of 10 days, the body dies. And so now, Abigail, even though she's already been married to a man, now she is free, according to the law, to marry another. Turn to um, Romans 7. I like this one of my favorite, favorite typologies and favorite teachings is the beautiful story of Abigail and how she was married to a guy. His name was Nabal Flesh, <laughs> Mr. Flesh, okay? And she's Mrs. Flesh. She don't like it, but that's who she is. And so... In Romans chapter 7, you see it perfectly clear. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. So, as long as Nabal was alive, and here's what I, here's what I think. I think when Abigail went to meet David, I think David looked at Abigail and said, she nice looking. Abigail bows before David. David's going, oh, this woman, she's a good one. She's a keeper. But then he finds out she's married to another. And David says, mm -mm. I'm not going to have anything to do with that. I'm not stealing this man's wife. Even though I'm strapping on my tool belt and I'm going to go kill the guy. I'm definitely not going to steal his wife. And Abigail then, I think, she sort of falls in love with David because she goes and she bows and she pleads her case. And I think for the first time in her life, she finally found a man that would listen to her, that would take her advice. And I want you to think about that in, in relation to, we have Christ who is our husband, and does Christ listen to us when we speak to him? Sure he does. Does Christ answer our prayers and supplications that we give to Him. Absolutely. And that's what you have with Abigail. She's going to David. She's saying, please don't, don't kill, don't come back and kill us because you're going to have to kill all of us. And, and I don't want to be part of that. I know my husband. I know he's a jerk. I, I know, I just know him, but please just don't, don't do it. That is your soul pleading on behalf of your flesh and saying, don't kill us both. Don't do it. So when Abigail goes back to her husband and she says to him, I went to see David. He's like, Aah. and she said, I asked him not to come and kill you. And he has a stroke because he can't handle it. He's so mad. Lays there 10 days and then he dies. So I, I always thought that there was, a, there was like a, an attraction between David and Abigail and Abigail and David. But both of them knew that to act upon that attraction before it was right 
would have, been, would have meant death to both of them. And neither one of them did it. It wasn't until David had word from his servants that Nabal had died that David finally said, I think I'm going to marry that woman. And so as they are leaving the area, they go by there. David sends messengers to Abigail and says, Our Lord David wants to know if you want to be his wife. And she immediately, she jumps on that. She doesn't have to think about it. And she takes five of her damsels. And I think that, uh, that shows us the relationship of that story to the rapture. Rapture is always associated with the number five. But anyway, she, uh, she gladly, her and her five damsels, go to meet David and she becomes his wife right then and there. Uh, so now, back in Romans 7, know ye not, let me put this full screen here, know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Now he's going to give this, for the woman, the soul, which hath an husband, the, the body of flesh, is bound by the law to her husband, that body of flesh, so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, as in the case of Nabal, she is loosed from the law of her husband. Now she is made free. So... On the day that your flesh body dies, your soul now is free to marry another. And who is it that you're going to marry? Jesus, the husband. So, um, verse uh, 3, So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man. Let's say Abigail just decided to leave David or leave Naboth because she knew if she, got, if she went back, he'd beat her to death or something like that. And she just went to David and said, David, marry me and hide me and cover me because Nabal's evil. God wouldn't have blessed that. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, the flesh mortal body she is free from that law because there's a rule in the law. And it's like this probably in every nation in the world. You cannot have a contract with a dead person. Can you? There's no contract ever with anybody that's dead. You say, well, what about a last will and testament? That last will and testament was written before the person died, goes into effect immediately upon the death of that person. But you can't have a contract with a dead person. So, if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she should be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another even to him who is raised from the dead that we should bring forth fruit unto God in in a marriage what is it that you bring forth fruit in children you have children okay and so that's uh, a little bit about what it's talking about my brethren you also become dead to the law by the body of Christ your flesh dies now your soul is free to be married to none other than the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus himself. That you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Again, I love that story. It's one of my favorite ones. Now, 
Here we go. And I'm not going to spend much time with this because it's four o'clock. But I'm just going to let you know we're going to, we are going to spend a little time with this. Uh, and the fact that I'm going to be here on Sunday nights for quite a while. Not going anywhere for quite a while. Husbands, love your wives. Now here's what's interesting. Paul didn't say to the wives, wives, love your husbands. He did not say that. He said, reverence your husbands. Love is something completely different. And uh, I think a good portion of the meaning behind this teaching, husband love your wives, is aimed at, uh, how can I refer to him, Mr. Macho Man. You, um, I don't know, maybe your dad was this way back in the old, the older generation. There seemed to be quite a bit of this. Where the man, he came back from World War II or came back from Korea and married a wife. And I mean, he whined her, he dined her, you know, he said all kinds of nice things to her until they got married. And then after they got married, pfft, nothing. The husband, in my opinion, has a greater responsibility to love his wife. And this love is unconditional. It doesn't, just as it didn't say, wives, see that you reverence your good husbands. It didn't say that. Wives, give respect to the husband if he treats you right. It doesn't say that either. And in this case, it does not tell us men to only love our wives when they're lovable. Or to only love our wives uh, when they love us first and they prove it. They show that love and they prove that love then you can start loving your wife. But it, that's not what it says. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So, uh, and right here, you just read the definition or God's definition of the kind of love that he's referring to. What is it? Anybody know? How do you define love? Unconditional love. Yes? How do you, okay, so how do you define that? I asked you first. How do you define it? I know, we already said that. How do you define it? Okay. Turn to John 3. This is a verse of scripture that Calvinists have a real problem with. I've seen them try to retranslate it. From the original Greek, make it say something that it just doesn't say. John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world. Now, was that love conditioned upon something that man did? No. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. 
So, to whom did God send his son? The entire world. Did God only send his son to those who would recognize God's uh, love gift to man and would accept God's free gift to man? Or does God send his only begotten son to every human being in the world? Every one of them. Now, just guess, take a guess at a percentage. What percentage do you think of people who have been born, lived, and died in this world since Christ came? What, what percentage would you put on the number of people who believe in the Lord Jesus to be saved? Do what? 15 or 20 percent? I think you're high. Yeah. I mean, I don't mean that you're high, high. I, th I think your estimation's high. Yeah. Yeah. I would say less than 1 percent. You're talking about billions of people living for the last 2,000 years. And the number of those people who truly have accepted God's love gift sent to them from heaven in an unconditional manner. Um, I think it's less than 1%. Straight is the way and narrows the gate and few there be that find it. And so for God so loved the world that he gave, he gave, there it is, he gave. Uh, Ephesians, husband, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So pure, God's pure love is always in his giving to man, to all mankind, even though most of mankind will reject God's free gift. He gives it to everybody, but most everybody's going to reject it. They're not going to have anything to do with it. They don't want it. They don't want any part of it. And I don't understand that. Uh, and I think it, I don't understand it because I think I have the right idea concerning salvation uh, in that it is, um, well, I don't know exactly what I'm trying to say there. Um, but I think most people misunderstand what this gift is all about. They don't think that they need it to get to heaven. And so therefore they reject it. But Christ, God truly gave his only begotten son to billions and billions and billions of people who he knew weren't going to have anything to do with it. They were going to reject it. And yet he gave it to them anyway. That is an unconditioned love that he has for all mankind, for all human beings who have lived past, present, future. Christ died for every single one of them. And I did. I read an article written by a Calvinist uh, who basically he, he did some things with the Greek here in John 3.16 and, and then retranslated it as like, for God so loved those who would trust in him or something like that. Anything but the whole world. So that God's offer of salvation is limited only to those whom God knows he will save. Okay, But it's not given to everybody on the earth uh, that's ever lived. So, uh, back in Ephesians, I'm going to stop here. Um, he gave himself for it, verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That also is a free gift conditioned upon nothing. There's nothing we have to do in order to receive it. 
Verse 27, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Think about that. If you do not love your wife, in an unconditional manner. Then boy you must really hate yourself. Uh, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his own wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh. But nourisheth and cherisheth it. Even as the Lord the church. And I was. Uh, I started to say this earlier and forgot it. But I remember one day when God made it very clear to me what my marriage to Lisa was really all about. Uh, part of it was showing to my children that um, their mom and I, we don't have perfect lives. Um, I've made mistakes, she's made mistakes. We have had to learn to forgive one another and to move on from those things. Um, or we wouldn't have lasted. It's that simple. And then it dawned on me the role that I was playing and the role that Lisa was playing. I'm Christ. She's the church. And as such... I'm to listen to my wife. I'm to hear my wife, let her talk. If I agree with her, I tell her, hey, I agree with that. I think we ought to do that. If I find myself not agreeing with her, um, I, it's a very simple approach with me. I pray about it. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm right. And she's wrong. And who else but God could change the mind of a woman? Amen, Sister Ellen? Who else but God can change a woman's mind? It's like the most impenetrable force in the universe. Um, or if I'm wrong. And she's right. God will show it to me. And then. I will have listened to my wife. And done the right thing. With what she told me. Because she was in fact right about it. We've had that. I've seen that. Dozens of times. Where I thought there was a huge misunderstanding between us. Come to find out. I either misheard what she said. Or I've had this happen. The devil scrambled it. Going from her mouth to my ears. That has happened before. And. Um, so I, I try to learn. To listen as much as I can. And. Um, and then. We'll let, we'll let God decide. Who's right. Who's wrong. We don't gloat over each other. Over it. We never say. Ha ha. I'm right this time. You have to listen to me now. We don't do that. But I realized that I was showing forth to the world Christ's love for the church. And there was just something about divorce that just didn't... I just, I just could never bring myself to it simply because it would be like Christ telling the church, I don't want you anymore. And he never, ever does that. And he never will do that. So that helped me, God bringing me to those conclusions. That helped me to understand the nature of our, of our role together. And um, that we do everything that we possibly can to keep our marriage alive. 
to keep it uh, full of life. Um, the, uh, the cruise to all of those hot, humid islands was her idea. But I did it. The next cruise, we're going to Alaska. That's me. Okay. Huh? Yeah, well, they'll, they set up a bunk bed in these rooms. You can have the bunk bed. Okay. You have to climb the ladder and all that stuff. So, All right, let's stand to our feet.